Good morning. My name is Mark Margolis, and welcome to Howard Center's Introduction to Suicide Safe Care Screening Resources. I'm the Suicide Prevention Coordinator for Howard Center. Hello, my name is Trevor Hanbridge, and I'm the Manager of Quality Improvement for the Howard Center, and I'm also a licensed clinical mental health counselor. And Howard Center defines itself by mission, vision, and values. Um, Clients are at the heart of our decision making. We are the designated agency for Chittenden County that provides mental health, substance use, and developmental services. And we're making suicide prevention a top priority. Additionally, we're committed to zero suicide safe care practices. So today we're gonna to be talking about some screening tools around suicide safe care and practices. Specifically, we're gonna be talking about the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale, commonly called the CSSRS. We're gonna be talking about a safety planning intervention called the Stanley Brown Safety Planning Intervention. And also we're gonna talk about counseling on access to lethal means, also known as CALM. While this is a, uh, a more thorough overview than you can find in a lot of places, it's not the entirety of a training. So we do recommend that you access the free resources that we'll talk about later on the respective websites for further training before you decide to implement these screening resources and practices in your setting. So today we're gonna cover um, a little bit about deaths by suicide in Vermont, so some high level data. We're gonna ground ourselves also in some best practice research and literature. We find that the tools that we're talking about are best practice and standards of care in suicide safe care. And we also find that when we collaborate um, across organizations using these same tools, that patients receive the care they need at the point of care more efficiently and more effectively, and transitions of care work better. And why are we doing this? Um, Vermont's rate of suicide is higher than the national average consistently. In 2021, 142 Vermonters died by suicide. We reached the highest rate in our history and the highest number. That's three a week, um, mostly men. And in 2021, 50%, that's the median of those that died by suicide had seen their primary care physician within the past month. And so primary care physicians are really the first line of defense against suicide and sui in providing suicide prevention. This is a research study that examined uh, primary care contact before suicide deaths. And generally what the research has found is that women die by suicide. Women have more frequent contact with primary care physicians prior to their death men still have a lot. Uh, ages vary. Um, people over 50 to 55 years old have the most contact with their primary care physicians prior to their death, typically a month prior to their death. This is a re research study that um, examines pra practice standards for suicide prevention. Um, Universal evidence-based standards are recommended for all primary care practices, regardless of integration of behavioral health. Universal depression screening and treatment is also recommended. Universal suicide risk screening is, not, is, is controversial, um, but it is definitely recommended that, practice, that, that patients that are high risk of suicide those patients with mental health diagnoses, substance use diagnoses, um, and prescribed psychiatric medications, those patients should have universal suicide screening. Also recommended is effective interventions um, such as counseling on access to lethal means, managing care transitions effectively, and addressing safety planning is also recommended. The Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale is the suicide-specific screening that's recommended. It comprises a validated series of questions to screen for and assess severity of suicide risk. The Columbia, or CSSRS, is used nationally by medical 
and non-medical organizations. And it's used by our local crisis agency, First Call and Howard Center. The Columbia allows for comparisons across settings and across time with patients. And it allows providers to stratify risk and help get patients on the appropriate safe suicide care pathway without overuse of resources. And why, why do we use the Columbia? Why use the Columbia to support clinical judgment? Many providers worry that a screening like the Columbia means replacement of clinical judgment, but it actually means to support and not replace clinical judgment. Um, up to 45% of people that die by suicide had a primary care visit within the past month. And for this reason, using the Columbia or a structured decision support tool such as the Columbia is very important. Um, in systems where suicide-focused care has been implemented, such as the Henry Ford Health System, rates of suicide death have decreased dramatically. And use of the, a decision support tool such as the Columbia uh, allows for a common language to discuss risk and foster continuity and coordination of care and reduces stress on patients, families, and systems. We at the Howard Center want to recognize the commitment that our primary care partners make to suicide safe care and suicide prevention. We also want to recognize that there always seem to be more screenings coming down the pipeline for you folks to administer. Uh, when we talk a common language or when we use common tools and we're able to stratify risk, as Mark said, we believe that patients are going to get the care they need at the point of care more efficiently and more effectively. And we also believe that there'll be decreased ER utilization so that if somebody's screening at a lower risk, there are options to handle and support that person in the primary care setting in collaboration either with your designated agency or private mental health providers. There are guidelines about when to use the Columbia uh, uh, that are generally accepted. Anytime a patient screens positive on question nine of the, the PHQ, um, anytime a patient mentions thoughts about suicide in a visit, if you have new patients at intake, a new patient at intake is, is another point in time when you would want to screen for risk using the Columbia. Or whenever there are warning signs like expressing suicidal thoughts or saying goodbyes or giving away belongings, though that's also a time when you would want to use the Columbia. If there are transitions in care, like a transition to a, a new medication or a seeing being assigned to a new care provider, during those transitions, it's really important to administer the Columbia. When there are new or acute stresses, such as the loss of a job or a divorce, that's also a time when you would want to administer a Columbia screening. Or when there's a change in mental status presentation, such as increased anxiety symptoms or the onset of symptoms of depression, at that point in time, you would want to also administer the Columbia. Generally, as, as indicated by clinical judgment, beyond these these guidelines, if your clinical gut is saying that you should screen for risk, then, then that is a point in time where you would administer the Columbia. We want to recognize the Columbia Lighthouse Project, the backbone organization for the CSSRS. Uh, they don't charge for their services and they're committed to zero suicide aims and prevention throughout the nation. And so you can receive free training from Columbia Lighthouse as well. We'll be talking about the Center for Health and Learning, which is a Vermont organization that supports zero suicide and suicide prevention. But we do want to recognize our partners at Columbia for sharing free resources and for promoting the work of suicide prevention in Vermont and throughout the nation. This is a, um, the screen with triage points for primary care. This is the version of the Columbia that is used for primary care providers. And you'll see that it is, um, it's broken down into six questions representing the <coughs> severity of suicide ideation, beginning with passive thoughts of wishing 
that one was dead or could fall asleep and not wake up, thoughts of killing oneself, and progressing to thoughts of a method, um, having thoughts with intent, having a plan with intent. So it, it progresses uh, through ideation severity. And question six includes questions about prior suicidal behaviors in one's lifetime and in the past three months. The Columbia ver screening versions also include triage points. Usually that means that the, for each color, low, moderate, and high risk, there are specific decisions that can be made for patient care. You may hear us talk about a suicide safe pathway to care, using the Columbia screening tool to risk stratify and to develop treatment modalities for the person's risk specifically, give us the opportunity to frame the patient's care where they arrive for care. Uh, so again, you may not need to refer to crisis services if somebody is at low risk or send them to the ED, but when if somebody screams at a higher risk, it is time to partner with your local crisis services or perhaps consider a hospitalization or a screening at the emergency department. Speaking a common language, again, gives us the opportunity to intervene at the point of care and we hope creates less stress for patients and families in the process of receiving the care they need when they're at risk for suicide. So we're going to be going through a role play where I'm the primary care provider and Trevor is going to be Brad, the patient. And in the role play, we're going to be demonstrating the use of the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. And after that, the safety planning intervention and then counseling on access to lethal means. For the section that's addressing the Columbia screening, please print out page 11 of your slides so that while we do the role play, you can be scoring the Columbia and having that practice. Thank you for coming in today, Brad. Yeah. It's good to see you. Tell me how you're doing. Well, apparently not so good since I had to come in here. I had another crap day at work. Um, mm -hmm. We lost a couple people and I'm the manager, but I had to cover a shift in the warehouse and you know, I freaking herniated a disc in mm -hmm. December and I'm not supposed to be doing that kind of stuff. And man, I just, you know, just came home and the pain was so bad that, it, you know, and I can't take any medication because of my CDL. And I, mm -hmm. I just went down to my wood shop today and my wife was you know worried I just said leave me alone um, you know she I didn't want to I didn't want her to come in I didn't want to be around anybody just feel like crap you know like this back is killing me mm -hmm. and I just you know I might have said something like it's not worth it to her and she got worried and mm. called the social worker at your office mm -hmm. well thank you for coming in and, and telling me about what's happening um, it sounds like there's a lot that's been going on at work yeah, it's, fr it's crazy. I mean, I can't keep people in. I, I'm not supposed to be driving the forklift. I'm not supposed to be moving boxes. You know, I I'm, I'm really don't even feel like I'm well enough to work sometimes. I just, you know, mm -hmm. this pain is either sharp pain or it's just like throbbing and mm -hmm. I got nobody to, to help me out. My boss really doesn't care. And, uh, yeah. you know, I it's a good job and everything. It's just that I can't get enough people to help and it just messes with my pain and yeah. I just, I can't take meds and uh, you know I just yeah. it's just too much sometimes it's just too much mm-hmm mm -hmm. it's on top of the work stress you have physical pain yeah and it's you're dealing with a lot right now yeah yeah, yeah. with everything that you've been dealing with um, have there been thoughts that you've had about in the past month about wishing that you were dead or could fall asleep and not wake up I mean yeah you know I um, Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when I get overwhelmed, I, 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 I you know, I do have those thoughts. I am, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And have there been thoughts in the last month of specifically about killing yourself that have happened? You know, I mean, sometimes it just gets bad, you know, like just, I know it's just, I know that eventually the pain will pass, 
Yeah, but yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there have been, yeah. you know, I don't, I'm, I wouldn't do it, but there have been. Have the thoughts been about like a way that you would end your life? I mean, you know, we got, we hunt as a family together. We got teenage boys and you know, it's turkey season mm -hmm. and uh, we got a hunt coming up and we got, you know, we got a gun, guns in the gun safe. And yeah, you mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. if I wanted to, um, yeah, I could use one of those guns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the pain and everything got so bad that there was thoughts about shooting yourself? Yeah, you know, just when it gets bad, you know, I feel bad I'm here. Like my wife, I worried my wife and, and you know, my sons weren't home from school, thankfully, but like, yeah, you know, it's just sometimes when it gets bad, I don't want to mm -hmm. kill myself, mm -hmm. but you know, I just like get overwhelmed and yeah. Yeah. I just want this pain to stop, you know, I just want the pain to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, uh, even a little bit in the past month had these thoughts and had any intent on acting on them? No, you know, like I think about it and I think, you know, I'd be better off not suffering like this, but then I think about my kids and, mm -hmm. you know, I think about my wife and I'm like, no, I wouldn't leave them, but I just, you know, I, I just don't see any way out sometimes and I get overwhelmed. Yeah. And, but like, I also get to the point, I know I won't kill myself, it's just that I just, I just don't have the answers and I like to have the answers to things and this mm -hmm. freaking pain won't stop and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's understandable how you'd feel that way, you know. Yeah, and you have your wife and your kids as yeah. reasons for living and. Yeah, and I feel bad I worried her today, but you know, she did, I guess she did the right thing calling yeah. you. Well, again, I'm glad that you came in. Have, have you been thinking about like the details of how you would end your life, like a time or a place? And None of that, no. Yeah, I just get these fleeting images of like grabbing the gun out of the gun safe, but nothing like, I can't even imagine shooting myself or, you know, yeah. dying that way. I just, I just get overwhelmed and yeah. so like, no, I, I, you know, I don't, you know, I haven't come up with any ideas about mm -hmm. what I do or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Has there been a time in your life where you came close to, to, to killing yourself? No, like before this injury, like I, uh, I ran a triathlon, I was an athlete, I can't exercise now. Okay. Um, you know, I was always happy and healthy. And then, mm -hmm. you know, one, one stupid move with a, a, a box and I herniate a disc and all of a sudden I can't feel my right foot, my back hurts all the freaking time. And, mm -hmm. I just, no, I mean, in the past, I've been a happy guy. This just sucks, yeah. you know? Like, yeah. I, I, I get it. I get that, I get that I'm giving into the pain, you know? Yeah, yeah, chronic pain is very intense, physical pain. Yeah, uh, have there been any times in your life where you started to try to do something to end no, your life? And, like, I, 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 somebody you know, stopped you? Or you I've never even, yourself, like, or? you know, I've never talked to a therapist before these past few months and never mm -hmm. had to think about this kind of stuff. Like, life was life, you know? Yeah. like until it wasn't the way it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you again for telling me about how you've been feeling, Brad. Okay. It's yeah, very welcome. helpful for me to get an idea of wh where you're coming from. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Brad, Brad completed the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale with me. And if you're following along and the scoring for the Columbia you would see that Brad screens at a moderate risk because he's had specific thoughts about how he would end his life in the past month, but he has had no intent and no plan, and he's had no history of suicidal behaviors in his lifetime, uh, particularly in the past three months. So we know that Brad screens moderate risk on the Columbia. This is a representation of um, the Columbia screening, the suicide severity screening scale. Also the Stanley and Brown safety planning intervention tool and the CALM counseling on access to lethal means. These are the, the tools that we're covering in this training. We want to recognize that using these tools in conjunction with one another is a natural way to support folks in a suicide safe care planning and pathway to care. Uh, one naturally leads to the other, as we'll talk more about. If somebody is screening moderate or high risk, then naturally the Stanley Brown Safety Planning Intervention or another uh, nationally normed safety planning intervention and utilization of CALM is called for. 
So the safety planning intervention or SPI or the Stanley and Brown safety planning intervention began as part of a treatment protocol, cognitive therapy for suicide prevention, roughly in 2005. And over time, it's developed as a standalone intervention in and of itself. And it's very scalable as an intervention. So it's been applied in research with emergency departments, psychiatric discharge, peers have administered the Stanley and Brown safety plan in emergency room settings, and also it's been applied in research on crisis lines. And when do we use the safety planning intervention? Essentially, any time that there's been a suicidal crisis, meaning there's been suicidal thoughts or suicidal behaviors, it can also be used when you're concerned about suicidal risk. And you would find the Stanley and Brown safety plan on the web. They have a website with a free training and the forms can be downloaded for free. So it's very accessible. And we're gonna run through how to use the Stanley and Brown safety planning intervention as well. But the first part of of the process with Stanley and Brown safety planning intervention is providing an evaluation or screening. And part of that is getting the, uh, talking with the patient and hearing what their story is about the suicidal crisis. So really giving the patient a chance to tell the story about what happened before, during, and after the suicidal crisis happened. And, part, and the next part of that is uh, teaching the client about cr the suicidal crisis and what that means. And we use the suicide risk curve as a tool to teach the, the patient about the suicidal crisis. And it's a way of explaining that the crisis is, not, is usually short term. It usually lasts only a short period of time. And it usually <coughs> escalates and de-escalates. And so the, we, we emphasize the use of the suicide risk curve as a way of teaching the client about what crisis looks like. It's also a good way to summarize the person's story about the suicidal crisis. And this is a representation, a larger representation of the suicidal risk curve. And again, this is free and accessible on the website. I want to emphasize a point that Mark made, that we do this in collaboration with the client or the patient, and it's a learning opportunity. You'll see as we demonstrate the Columbia and the Stanley Brown and Calm in the role plays, that Mark uses a teaching method and a learning method for the client, and we see that the outcomes are better in terms of the patient's engagement with the safety plan and the thoroughness of the safety plan. This is the safety planning intervention form itself. It's accessible on the web page. The form is a prioritized list of warning signs and coping skills, internal coping skills, social coping skills or distractors, and resources for accessing help. It's a step-by-step, stage-wise process where the provider and the patient sit down together and collaboratively develop this plan together. It's flexible, so it doesn't have to be a rigid step-by-step -step process for the patient. If part of the, the skills that the patient is trying to use are not working, then the patient can skip down in the list. Um, it's very individualized. The best outcomes with the Stanley and Brown safety planning intervention happen when we use the, the patient's own words and their, what they say would work for them and write that down on the form. The more thorough the plan is, the better the outcome. The more individualized, the better the outcome. This plan should not be used with patients that are intoxicated or experiencing psychotic symptoms or that need immediate rescue. Over time, the plan should be revised depending on how well it's working for the patient. And so it's really meant to be a living process and a living document rather than a one-time event. 
And it's, and so essentially it is a it is a process that we complete with the patient collaboratively. And it results in a written list of warning signs, coping strategies, and resources that the patient can use during a crisis, but before the crisis escalates to its worst point. Typically, the safety planning intervention takes 25 to 45 minutes. It is very important to know that it is not a no-suicide contract where the patient is expected to promise that they won't attempt suicide. So this is very different than a no suicide contract. Um, for further information and free resources on the safety planning intervention, please visit the website, uh, which can easily be found on the web and has downloadable forms and uh, a training through YouTube. Counseling on access to lethal means is an integral part of the safety planning process, or counseling on access to lethal means, also known as COM. COM is a training for providers. It's a suicide prevention training for providers, and it's most well known for how well it focuses on teaching providers to have a conversation with patients about lethal means safety. And it's very patient-centered, very collaborative. There's a free training online for COM, which we would recommend you use as a primer. Uh, the best training outcomes, though, come with an in-person training in COM, which can be accessed through COM America. But the online training for COM can be completed in approximately two hours, and, but it doesn't have uh, educational credit. And COM is, uh, is a training in suicide prevention that provides guidance on how to discuss the, co the, con the topic of lethal means reduction. So it's very important that it, to, to know that it's a discussion um, rather than a provider telling a patient what they have to do. But the provider has to be able to advise patient on, patients on uh, uh, strategies for lethal means reduction, such as off-site strategies for storing of firearms, how to store firearms safely in the home, uh, medication storage, uh, or any uh, discussion of any other methods, of any other thoughts that the patient has had about how they would end their life, that becomes part of the discussion uh, uh, between the provider and the patient in terms of how to address lethal means access. And the training, it, it gives examples of strategies to help patients and their families to reduce access to lethal means. And the training discusses how to appropriately follow up from those discussions. We want to encourage folks to consider um, lock boxes or lock bags. We have those at the Howard Center that we can share with partners on some occasions, particularly we share them with patients. But we do encourage you to look into those means of restricting access. We also want to recognize that we've covered three screening tools and uh, we're going to demonstrate these tools in paper form. But we want to affirm and recognize that Mark and I have worked with many partners throughout Chittenden County and the UVM Health Network and many folks have scaffolded in these screening tools into the electronic health record. Now there's a benefit to doing that because I think ease of administration comes into play in those moments. Um, also from a data perspective, we could begin to look at trends across time and we could begin to identify panels to support. Uh, so we strongly encourage you to talk with your EHR vendor about integrating these screening tools into your electronic health record. Uh, we believe that tracking the use of these screening tools over time will support uh, best practice care for patients experiencing suicide risk. It, it sounds like the pain and the stress at work just got so intense that so much that you had these thoughts about about using a gun and shooting yourself. Yeah, I just got overwhelmed. I just yeah. wanted to be alone. I just wanted it to go away and mm -hmm. yeah, I just worried my wife. I know I'm, mm -hmm. I don't mean to waste your time or anything. No, I'm glad that you're here and, and, and talking about this so that we can figure out ways to help, yeah, together. 
there's a there's a something I wanted to go over with you. It's called the suicide risk curve. And basically it's a diagram that shows how suicide crisis happens. So this curve is the suicide crisis. And this line below is time. And the line on the side is risk. And crisis happens in a certain way. So it usually starts with warning signs. And then crisis then escalates typically to where thoughts about suicide happen. So here is where you it, you had thoughts about using a gun to shoot yourself. Oh, so that's like the highest point. That's yeah, like that, the was, highest that was point. today. That was the worst I've yeah. been. That was just like a cover in that shift and just wrenching my back. I just didn't want to deal with anything anymore, you know. Yeah. So I'm hearing, you know, physical pain, but just so I make sure that I understand, what do you think kind of led up most closely to those thoughts, like feelings? Be or like, um, I don't know, even thinking of going to work, because I, I know the guy called out last night, uh -huh. you know, so when I got up, I was like, you know, pissed and like just, mm. you know, my wife asked me if I wanted some breakfast and I snapped at her, because I'm already thinking about, well, what okay. am I gonna do at work? Because I gotta, you know, somebody's gotta drive the forklift, somebody's gotta move the boxes. My boss doesn't give a crap about it, so like, mm -hmm. you know, I just you know, got up irritable and I was like snapping at people. Yeah. So it sounds like feeling angry and irritable yeah. was part of what led up to yeah, those thoughts. Yeah, like just anticipating what what, the, yeah. the, what, what, what was going to hit me when I walked through the door at work. Mm -hmm. So you were anticipating like what was going to come your way. Yeah, I knew it was going to be a crap day. Mm -hmm. Ended up being a really the worst day, you know, like I shouldn't be doing this stuff. So anticipating the worst? Yeah, yeah. you know, I knew it. I had a feeling I was going to, you know, wrench my back. So the worst in terms of your pain and what yeah, was going to come like your I'm, way I'm at the, work. I hate to say it, but I'm like, you know, like I'm scared of the pain because it just, it's, mm -hmm. I've never been like this before. I never had this happen. And mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. it's like this freaking unwelcome guest on your body, you know? Mm -hmm. Was there anything else that led up to the thoughts <sighs> in know, addition to those feelings? I, ch I was checking my phone at night for my work messages, mm -hmm. and that's how I found out he was calling out. Okay. You know, man, I... My wife tells me to put the phone down, that it only stresses me out to check work. They don't pay me for checking my emails. You know, like, mm -hmm. I did that last night, and, you know, I know okay. when I pick up that phone, it's almost like I get that, you know, the ringing in my ears or something. Like, I know, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, like, looking for the worst to happen or expecting the worst. So it kind of started with checking messages yeah. and kind of built up yeah. to anger and then anticipating and then... And then freaking, of course, I got to drive the forklift and mm -hmm. sure enough, moving a box, a large parcel, I just wrenched my back and it was just, yep. you know, I just put my head down and I, you know, there's nothing I could do. I had to push through it and yep. I just freaking barely could sit in my car on the way home and mm. it just... Everything I was worried about beforehand just got worse. And when I got home, I was just like, there's nothing to do about it except suffer. Yeah, so there's like a wrenching pain. Yeah. And then, and then at that point, that's when the thoughts. Yeah, when I, after I got home, I yeah. was, you know, pretty worked up in the car. Yeah. You know, I, 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 like I said, I like to have the answers to things. I like to plan things out. And I can't come up with a plan for this, you know. Okay. And if I can't, I just... I can't figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing also maybe some feeling like hopeless about figuring out what to yeah, do. Yeah, well, I can't have surgery. Um, they say that's not going to work. You know, I can't get out of work to take my physical therapy appointments. I can't take medications because I got a commercial driver's license. So, like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, ice, ice mm -hmm. and heat. Yeah, mm -hmm. ice and heat. What happened afterwards? Like, this is where the the like after the crisis is at its peak. I How, used to love the woodwork, after? you know, my shop downstairs. Mm -hmm. So I figured, you know, my wife was home, she was on the phone with her sister, and yeah. I was just like, you know, I just don't want to be around anybody, and I just went down the basement, I locked the door, you okay. know. Um, I grabbed a beer and had a beer, and just like, just, just kept kind of, you know, getting worse. Like, I just kept thinking about this is uh -huh. not gonna end. And I just don't, I, I, I want it to end, you know? Mm -hmm. And my wife wanted me to, uh, to come up for dinner and I just said, give me a minute, give me a minute. And, yeah. you know, she's like, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I said, don't worry about it. It's, you know, whatever, nothing matters anymore. Mm -hmm. And 
and you know that wasn't that just set her off and that's mm -hmm. when she called the social worker mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you went down to the basement and to the shop and yeah you know I thought it maybe calm me down but it just made it worse being down there and just mm -hmm. you know freaking pacing around and mm -hmm. seeing all the stuff I haven't gotten to yeah and had a beer yeah had a beer yeah. and that, you know didn't mm -hmm. make me feel any better really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you came back up eventually she was yeah. like look I'm gonna you know I'm gonna call do I need to call the police? I'm like, God, no, don't call the police, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, well, she'd been to the doctor last week and met that social worker, okay. you know? So she just called you guys. Yeah, she called for help. Your yeah. wife called for help. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so that's kind of how the crisis happened then. It, and, and when. How were you feeling at this stage? Uh, I, you know, I guess by now, right? Like I can talk about it, and yeah. I don't feel good right now. But I, you know, I reckon I get it. Like, yeah. you know, like I can't just end everything because mm -hmm. I don't have the answer to how to feel better. I, I, mm -hmm. You know, I, I was pissed at first that she called because I just wanted to be alone. But I, yeah. I guess she did the right thing. You know. Yeah. So she kind of get why she called. Yeah, I get it. You're not necessarily feeling better, but. Yeah, there's something I get it. yeah okay I mean I'm not you know I'm not easy to live with like this I don't like living with myself like this you know so I get it well I think it'd be hard for anybody to you know with what you're dealing with how much pain yeah yeah, yeah. so this gives this gives me a good sense of what the crisis looked like for you Brad and yeah so like starting and then getting yeah. to that peak of yeah of yeah, the I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, so I'm feeling better now, kind of, you know. But like, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what I wanted to do together next is for us to look together at a, a safety plan, because when when you're starting to have these warning signs, that's a time where having a safety plan is really important. Like you can pick up your safety plan. And, and use that plan and then that will prevent the crisis from escalating. You know, guess, so we'll do yeah. that together. Um, and so this is called the Stanley and Brown Safety Planning Intervention. And we'll do this together and basically what I'm gonna kind of guide you through this. Okay. And um, the first part of the plan is what we'd wanna look at what your warning signs would be. So based on the story that you've shared, what do you think the warning signs would be? Uh, I've had to think about it. it. was picking up that stupid work cell phone last night, mm -hmm. you know? Like, don't, I, I'd be, before I picked it up, I'm like, oh, some, I'm gonna see some crap on here that's gonna make my day horrible tomorrow. Okay, so picking up the work cell phone. Yeah, at night. I mean, nobody says I have to, but I'm like, what am I gonna do? I gotta get ready for the next day. But I don't have to pick it up, you know, like. Okay. But that sounds like it's a pretty clear yeah, I hate that. Sign. I hate that friggin' phone. Yeah, yeah. I can't even figure out how to turn the notifications off when somebody sends me an email from work. It's just it's maddening. So, Technology is really complicated. You, so picking up that work cell phone at night. Yeah. That sounds like it's going to be a, a good warning sign for us to look at. Are there, based on your story, are there any other warning signs, things that led up to oh, yeah. the thoughts that? Like I said, before all this happened, like I just was like pretty easygoing, you know, like mm -hmm. in control, and you know I, I wasn't a jerk to my wife, and you know, mm -hmm. and I get it. I'm when I snap and I get irritable, and the kids are playing their music, and I'm like, you know. I, I just can't get any peace. Um, okay. I guess they, you know, my wife's told me that I'm a lot more snappy and a lot more like mm -hmm. grumpy. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I'm, like last night, I was pissed about work and then I couldn't get in a comfortable position in the chair. Yep. And yeah, I was like snapping at everybody. So I guess that, that's like a warning sign that I'm really, you know, in my head and pissed off and okay. feeling pain. In my head and pissed off? Yeah. Okay. Because it's important that we use your words for this so that yeah. we really get to that. I mean, like, yeah, I just, in my head, I don't want to deal with anybody when I get like that. Yeah. Are there any other warning signs, anything else that we, we could have for number three that kind of led up to the thoughts? 
Well, I mean, my physical therapist, you know, she's like, she calls it flare up. So like, mm -hmm. last night was a flare up, you know, like, so I check my phone and I'm upset about work and I'm yeah. pissed off in my head. And then all of a sudden, you know, I get this twinge and I can't even sit down on my lazy boy and I mm -hmm. gotta stand up and walk around and I'm tired. And so yeah. I guess, you know, that pain, you know, those, those pains when it starts coming on. Yeah that's just gonna put me in a freaking bad mood or make my mood worse like it did last night. You know, yeah. I don't know what came first yeah. at this point. But it's like a twinge or a flare up. It's, yeah, it's just, it's, a, it's really intense. I mean, it can be like somebody, you know, sticking a baseball bat in my lower back and then, you know, and then mm -hmm. if it's not that, it's, I can't feel my right leg and you got this thing called drop foot where my foot's numb. You know, I feel like an invalid uh -huh. and I can't, yeah. You think if we say that the warning sign is like a flare-up? Yeah, I'd say a flare-up. doesn't always happen, but it's happening every day, but it doesn't always happen. Sounds pretty intense, though. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Do you think these warning signs are going to work pretty well for our plan? I mean, I don't know. Like, yeah. what do I do? Do I use them like like the phone? Am I yeah. remind myself not to pick it up? or? Mm -hmm. Well. So the one one thing that we'll do with this plan is when you when you when you get that impulse to pick up the phone or you have these warning signs then the idea would be then to start practicing like skills to distract yourself like on your own yeah. like things that can take your mind off that phone for instance okay. or the flare up like what kinds of things do you t do you think that you could do even for just a little little while that t would distract you from these warning signs? I don't know. My my best friend lives like in the neighborhood, and his name's Jake. And like <laughs> he talked me into this cold plunge thing the other day, mm -hmm. where you get together with a bunch of hippies and do a breathing thing for like an hour, and then you jump in the lake. And I thought it was all kind of you know just you know fluff but uh -huh. man I tell you what I was so calm after that uh -huh. and I was calm and I didn't have pain for like two hours and he's just been like he does it every day wow so okay. I've done it three times with him and yeah I mean like when I do that I don't know if it cures it or if it makes it less bad but mm -hmm. it definitely makes a difference he's got like this cold this tub on his deck and he fills it with ice and uh -huh. he does it every day and he sits in there for like four minutes uh -huh. I can do a minute or two but uh -huh. but I always feel better than I do that I guess the cold know. plunge yeah it feels good it changes the way my brain's thinking and it changes the pain and just kind of snaps me out of that you know that mm -hmm. crappy reality whatever I'm feeling mm -hmm. and what are some other things in addition to cold plunge? Like if for some reason you're not able to do a cold plunge, like are there any other things like you can do in, on, on your own? I mean, you know, like my oldest son's a baseball player mm -hmm. and he's gonna be in the varsity team and you know, I've got a lathe downstairs and I've got this nice piece of dried hardwood to make a bat for him and mm -hmm. I mean, I can stand and do that. There's no reason I can't do that. I love my wood shop. I just haven't been down there because I've been in a bad mood a lot when yeah. I have to work. And, but I do love being down there, you know, like mm -hmm. the smell of the wood and making a bat for him. I, I guess I, I could start working on that bat. That feels like it'd be like a positive yeah. distraction. Like when I'm, even when I'm working at work, if I'm on the computer, if yeah. I'm planning things, like if I'm distracted and I'm not thinking about the pain, it's better, yeah. you know? So maybe I could turn that bat for him. Mm -hmm. So making a bat for your son? Yeah, on the lathe in my basement. On the lathe, yeah. okay. I like being in my wood shop kind of helps me just unplug from the day. Like I said, it's a good job, it's just a hard job and people are always quitting and makes my life harder physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. But this making that for your son, yeah. it sounds like it'd be an extra step of kind of giving you some more focus and openness. I think so. Uh, you know, so you're kept busy down in the shop. Yeah, I yeah. can do that. Yeah, is there anything else that you feel like we should add to the plan that you can do like well, you know, like I used to go to the gym all mm -hmm. the time and I was in this running group with my buddies and like my physical therapist was like, well, you know, take a break from running and start swimming. Yeah. I'm like, you know, because mm -hmm. we do physical therapy in the pool. Mm -hmm. and my wife got a membership to the Y, so I could be like, you know, telling myself that it's okay that I can't do my reps and my lifting and my running, but 
I can swim. Yes, swim you know, I guess that's good for my heart and good for, mm -hmm. you know, like my body. Bit better than just complaining about not being able to exercise. It, mm -hmm. you know, feels like that could move me in the right direction. She says if I swim and I do exercises in the pool, uh, it strengthens my muscles and it helps my back and, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So swimming at the pool and the Y could be Yeah, something? I mean, yeah, my wife got that membership, so I guess I, that would make, seems like it could make me feel better. Okay, so, we, so with this plan, like if these, if these strategies are not working, Brad, then the idea with this plan would be to move to step three, um, where you would, you, would go, you would hang out with people, like who are some people that you can talk to just for like social distraction, just to like take things off your mind, even for a little bit of time. Well, like there's Jake, you know, my best friend in the neighborhood. He's, mm -hmm. you know, we both basically work the same schedule and we we're part of the same um, fitness and running group. But like, uh -huh. you know, like he's always available. He gets it, you know, like he had a shoulder injury from work and he mm -hmm. was, had to have surgery and like, you know, we've been mm -hmm. friends for a long time. I can always call him or just walk over there. Mm -hmm. What's Jake's last name? Henry. Henry? Yeah. Okay. What's his phone number? We should have his phone number here for uh, you. Oh, it's 355. Okay. 5555. Five, five. Okay. And is, in addition to Jake, are there, is there anybody else that you can, you know, go to to just hang out with or talk to distract yourself? Like any other? Oh, yeah, my dad lives across town and we're pretty close. We talk, mm -hmm. but he always needs, you know, stuff done around the house or he just likes to visit and talk about baseball or mm -hmm. you know take him out to go shopping because he can't drive anymore so mm -hmm. I, I like you know I like hanging out with him he's usually pretty chill and okay. he gets it you know like he's had a stroke and his life has changed and yeah. I didn't have a stroke or anything but my certainly my life because of my health has mm -hmm. changed and you know he's really kind of yeah. sympathetic toward it so he's he doesn't mm -hmm. like you know he doesn't baby me but he also gets that it's not easy, you know, mm -hmm. he was a hard working guy. And mm -hmm. What's your dad's name? Uh, Todd. Okay, Todd. Martin. Martin, okay. And what's your dad's phone number so we can have that too? Uh, his is 591 okay. 1111. Okay, great. Is there a place that you've, um, like a situation or a place that you've gone to to take things off your mind? like? Um, some people, for instance, say like the bookstore or the, the, the mall, like is there a place or a situation that you find helpful? In my running group, we're, we were pretty competitive, you know, mm -hmm. but two or three guys have been like, look, dude, let's, let's just walk, you know, we'll walk every morning for an hour, mm -hmm. the bike paths right near our house. Um, mm -hmm. I did that like three mornings and actually it wasn't so bad, you know, like it made me not think of mm -hmm. work being the first sucky thing of the day. It was good mm -hmm. to talk with the guys and I actually felt better, you know, stretching out my my legs and my back and stuff. That that was good for me. So, you know, the guys are good. They I I felt like first they were like just babying me, you know, like, oh we'll walk with you, but no, yeah. it's good. So walking with the guys? Yeah. Okay. So we got some do you feel like these strategies are gonna work pretty good for you then? I think so. I, if I can do them all, you know, yeah. like I get it now that there's mm -hmm. like, there's more options, I guess, than yeah. just locking myself in my basement, feeling sorry for myself and getting pissed. But yeah. If those are not working, then with this plan, you, we would then go to step four, which are people that you would actually go to, to talk about how you're feeling, you know, for like help. Yeah, like um, professionals or like family or it can be professionals but it's you know let's uh, let's first look at like are there any personal like family resources like friends or family members that or like a yeah like I mean you know like, or like any my wife's you know we're best friends and stuff and she gets that I've been distant and mm -hmm. you know she was the one that called to ask for help and didn't make me feel guilty or ashamed about it you know she yeah. was just like I get it um, you know she wants me to ask for 
not just help, but like talk to her more. So certainly she's, you know, she's my best friend. So my wife is definitely okay. somebody I can lean into. Okay, and what's your wife's name? Brenda. Brenda, okay. And Brenda's last name? Martin. Martin, that's right, thank you. Remind me of Brenda's phone number? Uh, 598-8888. Okay, great. Okay. Is there anybody else that that um, that you can go to, like personally, for Well, I mean, like, you know, kind of like doing stuff up there in that last one, like Jake and my dad are great. You mm -hmm. know, like I don't necessarily need to go over there, but I can always call them, you know. They're yep. always like, text me or call me, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, they're all, my dad always gets back to me, he's retired, and you know, like I said, Jake and I work the same schedule, so I can always reach out to him by text or call him. And you can talk about what's going on with Jake and your dad? Yeah, they know. I mean, I don't talk about it with the rest of the fitness group or the walking group, but Jake knows, because okay. like I said, he had that bad soldier, shoulder surgery, and you know, he's been through it, and uh, kind of come out the other side of it. You know, his pain's not... Yeah. Not all the time, and it's not excruciating, so maybe, you know, I hope to get there someday. As long as you feel like the, these these folks can, like, listen to you and be supportive oh, yeah, they're cool. what you're they're going just, through. Yeah, they don't judge me, and they don't, yeah. you know, my other buddies at the gym kind of be like, you know, suck it up, buttercup, but these mm -hmm. guys get it, you know. They get it. Yep. If, if this is not helping you to feel better talking with Brenda or Jake or your dad, the next step would be for us to have a crisis number, a professional resource that you would call, and it should be a resource that's available 24-7. Yeah. Um, is there a resource that you feel like we, we can put on this, we should put on this part here for professional help? Well, like, you that? know, my, we brought my kids to this place, this counseling place, and, mm -hmm. you know, my wife suggested that I after I hurt my back and I was out of work for three weeks and I was really irritable and grumpy, she, you know, this was back in December, January, she, mm -hmm. you know, she got a name of somebody there and okay. Jason and I've been seeing Jason, you know, once a week he sees me at night so it's after work, you know, and he's, you know, like he's got experience, he's had his own challenges in life, his own injuries and we talk about the pain and, you know, my mood because, you know, like I said, I don't, I was always a positive guy until this happened. Yeah. So he's got this uh, answering service. He's always like, look, if you need to get a hold of me after hours, if you're in trouble, like my wife called him today to leave a message. She's, you know, okay. he's like, you can reach out to me and I'll call you back, so. Okay, what's Jason's last name? Um, Hanover. Hanover, okay. And let's have Jason's number just so you have that in an emergency. I think it's 355. Three 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 three. Okay, great. And just in case, like if if for some reason Jason's not working as a resource, is there another emergency contact professional resource that? Comes I, to I don't mind? know how available are you guys. Like it's you know late afternoon and you were able to get me and I don't know if like I should call. You. I don't know. You know yeah. if I should call you. Could I Call yeah. the office. Yeah. Well, we certainly can. We're part of. We're linked with First Call for Chittenden County. Okay. You know that's our crisis team, and so, you know, First Call is a twenty-four-seven crisis program. Okay. And so you can literally call any time of the day or night. Are um, they doctors there, or what is it? They're clinicians. They're mental health clinicians. Oh, okay. And but they follow up with doctors. It's part of their protocol is to follow up with doctors. So I would know that they've helped you and that you've talked with them. They would keep me updated. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that, and that's just if Jason's, you know, if Jason's not working. Like, would you want to have first call be on the plan too? I guess. I mean, like, if he's on vacation and I get to a point where I'm just. Like you're, if you're not available, and yeah, I guess it'd be good to have them on the weekends and stuff if okay. I needed some help. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure that somebody's available like around the clock in case I'm not. Okay. And, you know, can I take this from you my can fridge? Have that. Yeah, yeah. I think we might have used them one time when my, my youngest son was struggling last year. The school mm -hmm. counselor mm -hmm. encouraged us to call to see if maybe yeah. they could, he was just 
kind of having to fit after school because he was getting bugged by kids. So. Yeah. They can help anybody of all ages. Okay. Yeah. You know, so we've got our professional resources to call in a crisis. Okay. Jason and First Call. Do you see any kind of barriers? Or is there anything, Brad, that might get in the way of you kind of practicing this plan? Like anything we should... You know, it's kind of how my brain works. This is like at work, I just organize everything, you know, okay. into the list and bullet points for the day. So like, I guess it makes it makes sense because like, okay. all, you know, when I get overwhelmed, like I can't think of all that crap at one point in time. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, it's helpful to have it all in an organized way. and. Yeah. Maybe I could, um, do I have to take the paper? Can I take a picture of it from my yeah. phone or something? Or But I can, we can do both. Okay. Yeah. Before we do that, the other, the last step of the plan is to think about making the environment safe. Like and what do you mean? Yeah, so step six is making the environment safe. And when there's crisis, you know, crisis can happen very rapidly and suddenly. And like you said, like when you know, just it's hard to think clearly, yeah. you know, and um, and so when people are in crisis, it's important to put more time and space between them and things that could be unsafe in the environment. Okay. You know, so for instance, like medications, for example. Um, My wife takes some medications. I, you know, mostly over-the-counter stuff. My, my youngest okay. son is on a medication that he gets from his doctor said, so yeah, I mean, they have some, we just keep it in the bathroom. Keep it in the bathroom? Yeah. Okay. Is there, um, it can be helpful to have a way of securing medications or like, um, do you have a way of locking medications at home? Um, we got, in the kitchen, we had this one drawer when we bought the place <laughs> that mm -hmm. came with a locking key. We've never used it, but the key was in it. Okay. And so there's like a drawer okay. in the kitchen that locks if, I guess we could use that. Okay. So locking medications in the drawer in the kitchen. I guess if you think that'd be a, you know, like, if we should do it, I, yeah. you know, yeah, I guess. I think if it creates more time and space, you know, um, in a crisis and gives you time to, uh, to call for help and to practice your plan, right. and that's going to increase the chances of that crisis de-escalating and, um, and from getting worse. Okay. How about, you mentioned, you, mentioned, you, you know, that, that you hunt in the past and, you know, we talked about the thoughts about shooting yourself. Um, what are, how about the gun? Like, how do you keep your gun safe at home? Well, we got like, um, we got a gun safe that's, it's got a fingerprint recognition thing mm -hmm. for the, and then, you know, there's also a backup key and like we're going turkey hunting next weekend okay. as a family. So, you know, we, you know, there's at least, we got three hunting rifles in there. Okay. Um, that's, you know, in the basement, we don't let the kid, obviously the kids don't, have access to it just my wife and I I mean okay. you know like we she knows and I know where the key is and her fingerprints are on it and mine are and you can like change settings and stuff but okay. you know I mean that's where the guns are and you know okay is it okay if I share an idea I guess yeah you know one of the best ways to to make the environment safe you know and this isn't about me being political around guns or anything you know, but keeping yourself safe, your family safe. Um, the best way to do that is to have your guns like out of the house just for a short period of time. You know, is there like a family member that can hang on to I your guns? I don't know, I feel weird about that. Like, yeah. um, you know, I grew up around guns and yeah. I get it, like I don't wanna die and I know, I know that's, you know, I know why I'm here and I know how I was feeling and I get that, you know, like I can get overwhelmed. Um, I yeah. definitely don't want to kill myself. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I do recognize that I thought about those guns. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't want my guns out of my house. Like if my wife's there alone for protection, I want her to have mm. access to them, you know? I okay. mean, there's been more break-ins and yeah. I, I don't want my guns out of my house. So that's like some self-defense purposes yeah. around the guns too. But you have a safe with a biometric Kind of lock. Yeah, I yeah. mean, like you can change that stuff. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind just having my wife 
like temporary delete my fingerprints and okay. and then you know she can just keep the key wherever she keeps the key but I'd rather have the gun secure okay in our house and like I don't want to ask anybody to I don't feel right about that but I get what you're saying yeah I mean she can you know I trust her she's been through firearm safety and we grew up you know hunting together and so like she can she can control the safe for a while. Okay, okay. So I can, you know, not lose it. Mm -hmm. So your wife would, she could change the biometric. Yeah, and she all you got to do is enter this. the master code, yeah. delete the, the profile, and then it's easy someday to set it up again. Mm -hmm. And then we only have the two keys, and we know where those are, so she, she could just take them. I trust her and, mm -hmm. you know, make sure I... She keeps them because we're going hunting next weekend. I That's feel right. you know, like you I'm not worried about it. Like I said, like I would never leave my kids and my wife, yeah. and certainly, uh, I would never do anything on a hunting trip. And no right. matter what, like I'm not gonna. Yeah. I just got overwhelmed, and I get it. You know, the guns are like an easy uh, fix or whatever. But like, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna kill myself. I don't want. I don't want to die. I just. Yeah. And so you got this hunting trip that's coming up, which is really important. Yeah, for yeah, you like it's where we bond. We yeah, got a camp. Yeah, yep. The boys are, you know, yep. getting older, and yep. so we can go there next weekend. We also have a safe there. It's it's one of those old school ones mm -hmm. with just a locking key, but it's like heavy metal, and yep. my wife can just be like the person who has the key, and okay. we keep all the ammunition and all the okay. firearms in there when we're not hunting. When you're not hunting, so that'll be our plan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's important with this for everybody to have a role. So like with, you know, what I'd like to do, if it's okay, is like talk with your wife, make sure she knows what her role is in terms of like the biometric adjustment and the medications and... Yeah, I mean, do we don't have to like tell the boys or anything, do we? Or no, no, just, just, you know, I don't want to worry them. I mean, I, you know, yeah, my just wife's your wife has I've already a role stressed her out. Yeah, and yeah. I get it, you know, like I'm... This is helpful, but okay. you know, I don't yeah. want to stress my boys out. No, I understand. Yeah, and then um, what I'd like to do is have us follow up with you in the next twenty-four hours, just to see how the plan's going. We give you a call, sure. um, and we'll have this plan continue probably for a few weeks until things start to feel better. You know, okay. and we get you linked to some help. Yeah, you know, like I said, I can't take the meds, but I can yeah. do the pool physical therapy, and I can yep. walk and. I get it, there's things I can do, you know, I just get in my head about it when it gets bad, but I get it, there's things I can do, I guess, yeah, yeah. more things than I thought I could do with more people to help. Yeah. And when we follow up, we'll kind of talk about if there's any part of this plan that's not working or we need to adjust, then we can always do that. Okay. Yeah, so in terms of like how you, you know, it's very important to have a system in place where you know where this plan is and... Yeah, you know, I'll take like, a picture of it so you and take a picture like, of I'll it. just... Yeah. I got this um, this metal clipboard that I use for work. You know, I mm -hmm. put all the crap in it, and so like I can keep it in there and okay. walk around with it. You Great. know, because work's stressful. Because like somebody's gonna call out sick tomorrow, but yeah. I don't have to. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, I don't have to freak out about it or look at my phone tonight about it. You know, yeah. I just, just kind wish of things would change there, but I can't. You know, I can't change that right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Thank you for coming in. Yeah, and you're welcome. I appreciate making the. Yeah. The time, I'm sorry, I worried my wife, and um, yeah. I think this will make her feel better. I feel, you know, like, not as desperate, and yeah. I get it, you know, like, yeah. I'm just not the kind of guy that's used to feeling out of control and not being able to, yeah. you know, feel okay, so. Yeah. Well, I think we got a good plan together. All right. Yeah. Okay, Brad. So we've completed the Stanley and Brown safety planning intervention with Brad, and part of that was completing the risk curve. And we completed a conversation on access to lethal means where we were able to effectively make the environment safe, but also be client-centered and patient-centered. Uh, patient um, and so thank you very much. Nicely done. That, that went it, well. Is it done now? Very nice. Okay. That was nice. That's oftentimes providers will are concerned that they won't have enough time to administer the screening and an intervention given the nature of primary care practices. 
Our screening is by definition brief, so the a screening like the Columbia should only take several minutes. With intervention, you really have to take whatever time is necessary to keep the patient safe and get the patient linked to resources. As Mark said, and as we will demonstrate, the Columbia is a relatively brief and important screening tool. Um, and we, we recognize that primary care practices are con constantly asked to integrate more screening tools, to track more data, to participate in more quality improvement practices. We also want to recognize the importance of zero suicide and the commitment of our partners in primary care to take this very seriously and to develop ways to intervene at the point of care in the medical home. Uh, I strongly recommend doing a PDSA cycle. From a quality improvement perspective, a PDSA cycle is plan, do, study, act. You could identify a small panel, for instance, as Mark said earlier, those patients with depression, those patients with a substance use disorder diagnosis, uh, annual well visits. It's important to start somewhere. And we hope to demonstrate through this training today that it is possible, it is possible to start. We also want to affirm in many primary care practices in Chittenden County, there are social workers and mental health providers either through the Blueprint for Health, and there are ways to get your front end staff and medical assistance involved. Uh, we enjoy our collaboration through quality improvement projects with primary care, and we strongly encourage you to start somewhere. Many providers also w w ask, should we use more than one screening tool? We sh should, we use, should we be using the PHQ-9 and the Columbia sequentially? We recommend as a suicide-specific screening tool to use the Columbia. The, if you're screening for depression and suicide risk together, then you could use the PHQ-9 or the PHQ-8 and the Columbia together. But it's recommended to, to avoid using the PHQ-9 as a trigger for the Columbia. And the other question that often comes up is, can't we give the patient a blank copy of a safety plan? The best outcome with safety planning intervention is to sit with the patient and complete the plan with the patient. So it's not recommended to have the patient complete the, the, the plan on their own without your support. So where to start and who to partner with? We're gonna share some resources with you at, toward the end of the presentation about other designated agencies throughout Vermont. In Chittenden County, the Howard Center is glad to consult with your practice about where to begin and which screening tools to use. We also encourage you to use your practice facilitators through the Blueprint for Health. And in the UVM Health, Health Network, we want to recognize that there is a system-wide pathway to care and support internally as well as externally to support your work in suicide safe care practices. So accessing support through first call, you, you might develop a workflow when you implement suicide safe care practices and part of that workflow will typically involve how to partner and, and call for help with your local crisis team. First call for Chittenden County is the crisis team for Chittenden County, which is part of Howard Center as the designated agency. First call for Chittenden County is 24 seven. We are available any day of the year, any, any time of the week to be called for help. And our number is 488-7777. We serve anybody within Chittenden County of any ages, and we're a mobile crisis team, which means that we can come to your practice, we can meet with patients at home or at schools. We want to stress a pathway to care, as Mark mentioned. It's important at the outset of any change in your practice or the development of a strategy to implement suicide safe care practices to develop a workflow, to know what to expect internally and to know what to expect from your partners. As a designated agency, we're glad to collaborate with practices so that you know what you can expect when you call first call for a crisis clinician. We also have an access and intake program, the front door to the Howard Center. And so we can also help you understand when it's appropriate to reach out to access and intake. For instance, if somebody's screening low risk and might need a connection with a therapist, or if they're a school-age student and might need a connection with a school social worker, 
access and intake can help get, get folks connected, families or individuals, to the care they need in the Howard Center System of Care, and they can also support you if you need to go outside the Howard System Center of Care. We also want to stress that nationally, the 988 Suicide Crisis Lifeline has rolled out in the last couple years, and throughout Vermont and throughout the nation, 988 is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to support folks experiencing a suicidal ideation crisis or in need of information or support for a family member. While those clinicians or those support folks are available 24 seven, those folks will not come out and see you in the community, but they will help you get connected to your local community mental health or designated agency. They'll provide a warm handoff, which means that they'll ensure that you get in touch with somebody or somebody gets in touch with you if you need to be seen in the community, at your doctor's office, or if need be at the emergency department. We strongly encourage you to use 988, and we're also gonna let you know about some other resources throughout Vermont for crisis mental health support. We wanna emphasize the folks at the Center for Health and Learning. Uh, it's an organization based in Southern Vermont and their commitment to zero suicide as the backbone organization to support designated agencies in partnership with the Department of Mental Health and the Blueprint for Health is exceptional. They have a lot of free resources on their website. Uh, they offer free trainings and they offer a suicide prevention toolkit for primary care and psychiatric practices as well. We can't say enough good things about our friends at the Center for Health and Learning. They have a very robust website. And again, we encourage you to check it out for additional training, support, and resources as you either implement or iterate suicide safe care screening and pathways to care in your office and across organizations. This is a list of the designated agencies throughout Vermont. Designated agencies, formerly called community mental health centers, serve all counties in Vermont. The Howard Center serves Chittenden County primarily, and we've got a list here for you of other county designated mental health services and their crisis support lines. So if you're living in um, Windsor County, you can call healthcare, uh, healthcare Services and Rehabilitation, um, but we strongly encourage you to develop a relationship with your designated agency, either the Crisis Services Center or the Intake Center, and to begin to talk about how you can partner to support the patients that you see in your practice. Also, the UVM Health Network has uh, hospitals throughout Vermont, and they have a strong commitment to suicide safe care. They have a, a pathway to care that supports the entire UVM Health Network to include our partners in New York. So if you are a practice in the UVM Health Network that's functioning in New York, uh, we've listed some crisis support hotlines for the Elizabethtown area, for the Alice Hyde Medical Center, and for Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital. We strongly encourage you to reach out to your partners to talk internally to your uh, champions around suicide safe care and develop ways to implement these strategies in your practice.